All right. Pop. Uh, so five two number closing point. Twenty-eight says this: Prove that the integral. Robert had your phone. From Robert M. Robert A to B. <laughs> All right, I like it. So, uh, how do you? Oh, good. They, 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 they give you that. Cool. I like it. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So how do we go about doing integrals uh, by 5-2? We don't know yet some connections that would make this really easy. It's too bad for us to find the change in that. All right, good. So, so the first step, <coughs> delta x and zero x i is b minus a over n. Yeah, good. So it's b minus a. Over n. So what's x i going to be? A plus b minus a over n i. Which then you square that. And yep. You Good. Multiply it by b minus a over n. Good. And then up to that i. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, at least you know that's the right way. So that's one. It's uh, it's not the answer you hope for, but at least it's the definitive answer. That's the way you got to go. I thought it was. If, if I could expand it into so this is uglier than what we did last uh, yesterday because they didn't give us any definitive numbers for these. So I don't have we don't have our normal two over n here. Uh -huh. so we have v minus a over n, whatever the hell that is. So my main question was: after you square it, do you distribute that i to the b and the a? Let's figure this out. Let's do the first couple steps. So there's that, right? So you can see that there's my this is here, this is here, and this is here. Right, so you can see the comparisons there. What is f of xi? It'll be square of this thing, right? But you got to foil out. That's good. If you foil this out, you get a squared plus uh, two a times b minus a over n uh, i. It's the middle terms, right? Plus b minus a over n squared i squared. If you foil that bad boy out, right? and this should be this should be bread and butter for you guys. Yeah. I, I can give you as ugly of a thing I want you inside of a square, and you just. Boil it out and you just do it. You just crank it. Right? Then that to be x plus 2 could be this. But because the process doesn't change. That's what math is all about. The process doesn't change. Uh, so I've got this best uh, times delta x, which was b minus a over n. Distribute, because the break up the, the sum sign amongst all the pieces. You see that? So you're going to distribute this, bam. Oh, okay, so you leave the i outside. That's where I, because I distributed <coughs> the i inside everything, and then it got really messy. No, why do I want to preserve this like this? Because I want to eventually get it to be a sum of i with stuff outside, because I know it was sum of i. I have a formula for that, right? Some of I squared, I know that. I have a formula for that. Right? We do. You do. It's right there. It's right there. And if you didn't get a handout, I asked you if you didn't get one. So everybody's got it, so everybody knows. I like that. It's a circle. The circle, no one should. <laughs> so is that pretty? No, not necessarily. Personally, I think it is, actually, but most of us probably would not. But I, I like it. And what is the antiderivative of x squared? x cubed over 3. Interesting. Interesting. So today we're going to prove the shortcut finally, thank God. 
which doesn't mean if you don't do 5-2 homework until later, you can suddenly come back and use a shortcut in 5-2. No. If you're doing 5-2 homework, you live in the world of 5-2. You only know stuff up to 5-2 when you're doing that homework. The further you get in math, the more you have to remind yourself of how much you know when you're doing homework. Do I know that yet? No. Shit, I don't know that yet. All right. So you are going the right way. It's not supposed to look better than that. It's going to look a little bit worse because there's more stuff I don't know. Okay. Maybe. Anything else from homework? 57 and 60 involves the properties of integrals, which I don't think oh, I good. understand how to use those. All right. So we're going to talk about the properties of integrals uh, right now. There's no more questions. I just need to. Uh, I'm still living off the Hall's cough drops. I love it. So any other questions from homework? As I attempt to rescue this Hall's cough drop from this wrapper. <coughs> ah. Um, what's somebody else worried about sticking Paul's cough drops on? Anything else? No? Okay, let's do this. Um, so let me finish out 5-2. <coughs> if you missed yesterday, I feel very bad for you. Um, because unless there's a question on it from homework, I'm not going to do another one of those uh, examples that are on the handout. All right, so that's how you do the homework in 5-2. This is sort of like us doing the limit definition of derivative before we learn the shortcut to derivatives. So it's the same thing with antiderivatives. Um, today I'm going to try to connect the idea, well, eventually. Um, the idea of finding the area with the antiderivative and show that they're actually very intimately related. Uh, but right now I just want to draw the properties that they tell you in section 5.2. Let do this roughly the same order. Oh, show you something interesting. The integral from A to B, so if I see the area uh, from A to B. Huh. And think about it. This, let me see if this, if this is, uh, makes sense. If, if A was 3 and B is 7, then this is related to this, and that would be 7 minus 3 over N. That would be 4 over N, right? So why does it make sense, then, that this is equal to negative integral from B to A? Why does that just make sense? Because if I go from B to A... It's still 4 over A. The distance didn't change. Now the width is going to... So the width is always this minus that over N. So now the width is going to be this minus that, which would be 3 minus 7. It would be negative 4 over N. So I'll get the opposite of what I would have gotten here. So if I go from A to B, integrate, I get the opposite of what I would get if I went from B to A, integrate. Now, now, on the surface of that, you're like, why the hell would I ever go backwards? Well, it's not a question of would you go backwards. It's a question of knowing this property and using it in the right place. So there will be places where I do want to know this property. Right? And in fact, we use it in connection with this next property. Here's your property number one. This is the only one we'll talk about yet, so we'll call it number one. Here's property number two. You see if you guys are cool with this. I don't want to say this. Sure, sure. So the integral from A to B, f of x dx. How does it relate to the integral from A to C and the integral from C to B? Two added. Yes. So the integral from A to B is equal to the integral from A to C. Plus what? C to B. So let me immediately show you something that's going to show up later today that merges these two things. If in the process 
of proving a theorem, <coughs> I run across this. Now, now, real, before I get too far away, does that make sense? I mean, please let that make sense. Yeah. If you get the total area, I add the areas together, it's great. It's a remarkable ground baking, breaking. And baking, it just bakes the ground with its <laughs> knowledge. Um, so if I, look at that, I'm swapping the black out for black. If I got something like this, um, well, I can't remember exactly what it is, but just make something up, Jeff. Let me blow your minds, sure. Um, okay. Now, you see. Do you guys see why I had to change that to a T inside? Because X is the variable of how far I'm going on the T axis. I can't say X is how far I'm going on the X axis. It's like, no. That is the x-axis. You need two separate variables for that. So if you don't quite see what I'm saying, I'm going to get a little deeper into it later. But just right now, I can use <coughs> these two to help me redo this. Can you guys see how? So look how a shortcut is. See how C is the middleman? Can you just add it and then... Um, well, what can I do with this using this property? Change that to a positive and then flip. So if I change it to a positive, yeah, you have to flip... Now it becomes. Oh, I, I wrote it backwards, but oh well, this, the idea is still good. <laughs> I wrote it backwards from what I wanted, but too bad for me. So now, now, so let me stop there for a second. So if I flip the limits, just to keep in mind that the that the b and the a would switch and it would become the opposite sign of what it used to be, right? Does that on its surface make sense? Okay, good. But now I can use that property. Because what's the middleman here? Uh, a. a. So it would be integral from... To x plus h. h. No, no, no. It would be integral from x plus h to x. Because from x plus h to a, plus from a to x. So I had these turned around, but that, uh, you guys hopefully were cool with this. So if I have the same thing on the bottom, I can just switch <coughs> the sign and then maybe combine them using that property. So that's where that really comes in handy. Cool. In everyday life, there's no real good reason to go backwards, right? Yeah. It's like, I'm going to read this book this way now. Well, no, it's probably a bad idea, unless it's not written in English. Uh, was it Hindu? Is it going to be Arabic. Arabic? Arabic? Hindu Arabic. Okay. All right. How are we doing so far? Is that... So the properties themselves make, hopefully, immediate sense. <laughs> Right? The properties themselves are pretty straightforward, and this is why the properties kind of are good to know. Yes? So, you have the integral of I guess, x plus h to x. Can you just do h to x? No. Because if x is yeah, yeah, yeah. 7 and h is negative 1 or something, just to keep it, then it would be 6 to 7, and you can't just pull the h by itself. Okay, good. All right. Just kind of thing is in our future. Okay, uh, let's see, what other properties? Some of these other properties, do they actually tell you? Good, they do. Good. So everybody got what they want from this? Yes. This is it annoying to have <laughs> chewing up most <laughs> I had a history teacher, Mr. Rudinsky, I'll never forget him. Every time I saw him, he had a Hall's cough drop in his every, forever. Every time. It was annoying. The, the room just smelled like Hall's cough jumps. Nobody had a sinus problem when they were in there, but still. Um, so this, this should kind of make sense. This is related to that thing we saw the other day with the um, um, summation of a, of a constant. Visually, what does this mean? What's the function that I'm integrating? C. So I want to know the area. So here's the function C. It's a constant, right? Yeah. So that area is just a freaking rectangle. What's the area of that rectangle? How wide is it? It's B minus A. B minus A. There it is. Times how tall is it? All right, that's one straight up fact. Right. So we can do that to any constant? Totally. Okay. So it kind of makes sense. Thankfully, the derivative 
of a constant is easy. The integral of a constant is easy. That's nice. That should be kind of expected since they're opposites of each other. It should be one should be easy where the other one's easy, possibly, not perfectly, but normally. Uh, well, what, what else did they put here? Blah 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 blah. Uh, integrals are based on what operation? Integrals are based on division. Sum. So the integral of two functions that are added together should just be the integral of one plus the integral of the other. Oh, and let me say this real quick. We are still getting used to this notation if you haven't had calc before. This is the first time we're seeing notation that's like bookmark notation. It encapsulates everything it's acting on. So these are like, I always look at these as book, not bookmark, but book ends. So the function it's operating on is everything in the middle. So this is saying the integral of the sum function is the integral, the sum of the integrals of each piece. And of course it is, because integrals are just adding. So I can add, uh, I can add all these additions or I can add each one separately. It's going to add to be the same stupid number. So that, that property is pretty straightforward. Obviously, if it was a minus, oh, amazing! Do they make that a whole? They make that a whole separate thing. It's amazing. Unfortunately, derivatives of sums and, and and subtractions are easy, right? You just take the derivative of each piece, right? Are derivatives of products easy? No. No, you have to use product rule. Are derivatives of quotients easy? No. no. So integrals of products. And quotients will be even more disgusting. We'll see. Oh, look at that. Somebody's had stuff before. All right. So this is two and four. They made it two separate things with plus and minus. Now, here's the big one. And this is related to the point I was making the other day. If I have the integral of a constant times a function, I can take the constant out all day long because the integral only cares about x. <laughs> Just like I was making that point about n and i and how far can you take something out. I have students that start taking x stuff out. No, you can't take x stuff out of an integral because the integral is all about x. That's only when the constant is a coefficient. Oh, sure, of course. Okay. It's, a, it's a multiplier. Okay. I like it. So a constant multiplier of a function, you can take it out. You can multiply them. And, and really, this is, since this is a sum, I'm just undistributing a c. I'm taking a GCF of c out. Yeah. Ooh. Mm. This so you couldn't do that if it was like four <coughs> plus x. Then exactly, that was the point. Okay. Oh. Uh, because then, can you can you factor anything out of four plus x? No. no. So you can't factor something out of the Once infinite sum. Okay. But if I had an integral of four x, that's equal to the four okay. all day long, because I'm just factoring a four out. Okay. Kick ass. Kicking ass. All right, good. Cool. So how are we doing there? Is that decent? Decent. All right. And all those properties are just based on the fact that integration is based on summation. Uh, let's see. Blah, blah, blah. There's this crap. Okay. So here comes the interesting stuff. Well, how do you oh. use those? Hmm? How do you use those? Uh, so what kind of form? Uh, let's see. The homework they throw at you. In question 57 and 60, for example. This is what I'm saying. Oh, well, all right. So there are some other properties uh, that are not as interesting, but we can go over them. All right. yeah, these are all in the book anyway. So there's some comparison properties. Um, if a function is greater than zero for all x in a to b. So if it's positive from a to b. Okay. Good. Then the integral of the function from a to b better be freaking bigger than zero, uh -huh. or equal to zero. You guys good? Yeah. So we already talked about the fact that if the function is negative from a to b, the integral will actually come out negative, which doesn't mean we suddenly have found negative area, dark matter. No, <laughs> right? It's just the negative just tells me the direction that my my values are in. Right? It doesn't mean negative area, like I made a, a, a 
plot of land, neg and like my students in algebra, they give me negative area and they don't think anything about it, right? I'm like, there might be a problem with that because I don't want to get next to your garden plot because it might suck me in. I don't know, is that a black hole? What is that? Negative area. <laughs> you know, it seems like a bad place to go. Uh, so that's one. If F is bigger, I'm not even going to write the whole thing down. If F is always at least as big as G, then the integral of F will be at least as big as the integral of G, right, from A to B. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? I don't see these as being very interesting. No. No. Yes. Uh, <coughs> that's a yes to you now. Oh, here's the one that's going to help you with the, with the problem you're talking about. This is the one that's mildly interesting. Uh, if f of x is between m and m, then the integral will be between m and m. Then watch this. This is interesting. Let's see why this makes sense. Then m times b minus a is less than or equal to the integral a to b, which is less than or equal to m times b minus a. Now this one is more. This is the interesting. I forgot that was in there. Is this the only one that's in there that's interesting? And this is the one that's going to help you with your question. Let's see why this makes sense. And actually, this is not overly... What's the absolute biggest that the integral of f could be? Is if f is always... Let's, let's assume that... It doesn't really matter. But let's assume that m and m are both bigger than zero, just to make it easier to talk about. <coughs> you guys understand? Yeah. So what's the absolute biggest that this could be? If f is actually always... What's the biggest F can be? Um, M. M. Big M, right? You've got to be very specific now. So the biggest F could be is big M. And what's the integral of big M from A to B? There's a, there's a property. If I integrate it as constant, it's M times B minus A, which, hey, is there. And what's the smallest the integral could be is if F is always the smallest it could be, and then it's equal to that. So we don't look, we don't look at M as a variable, but more of a constant. Yes, for any given function. So, for example, if the function is 2 sine x, what's m going to be? 2. No. Big M is going to be 2. Okay. And little m is going to be? 0. What does 2 sine x go from 2? Amplitude? Negative 2. Yes, negative 2 to 2, right? So the integral of 2 sine x from 1 to 3 I can say it's going to be between, it's less than or equal to, negative 2 times 3 minus 1. And it's great, it's less, I'm sorry, greater than or equal to that, and it's less than or equal to 2 times 3 minus 1. So it's in between negative 4 and 4. Oh, so it just wants, okay. Because it was asking me to evaluate, and I was like, I'm not getting any exact values here. I'm just kidding. Yeah, you can't get exact values. They just want a, a bound for what the answer is. All right. This is again. This is another one that's good for some theorems because it's not very good for uh, using to do because you normally the bounds are so big. It's like okay, thanks for that. <laughs> Best to make by chance is doc. And we're from one percent to ninety nine. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right. So you're saying you got a chance. All right. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite scenes. You're saying I've got a chance. No, no. Anybody know what movie that's from? Well, you said Doc, so I'm thinking back to the future. No, I said Doc just because I don't know. Oh, it's from uh, Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Excellent movie. Well, he says it's like one in a million chances. Yeah, exactly. So you say it again. All right. All right. So enough of this stuff. Blah, 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 blah. Um, blah, 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 blah. So now I want to, uh, so section 5.3 is a very important section, and it, it, it kind of comes right at you that's going to be very important because it's titled, The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. So you sort of, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Title theorem is if you don't brush, you will develop calculus. And <laughs> calculus is a tensile condition, actually. But oh, well. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> I will laugh at you. <laughs> um, 
It is. Um, so, if I... I want to start this off. Okay, I can do that. So this is kind of like what I was saying earlier, and I'm going to make it very in your face here. So I, I want to find the area under a function from zero to some value on this axis. Do you understand that I can't call this the x-axis? Because x has to represent that specific place. So I'm just going to call it the t-axis. So I want to know the area, this area, right? And I'm going to call, and obviously, now we know what this is. It's uh, the integral from 0 to x of, all right, so that, what does that represent? The area from 0 to x of the function. The area of. Good, the area under this function from 0 to any value you want. You guys with me? So this, so it depends on x, right? So for a given x, its output will change. It sounds like it is a function, and it is. It's a function. I'll call it g of x. So if I put a 7 there, I'm going to find the area under f from 0 to 7. If I put an 8, the output would be the area of f from 0 to 8. So it is a function. So what I'm curious about is, what's the derivative of this function. If some of you guys that know calculus, you should know, well, you should know the fundamental theorem for one thing in the calculus. Um, Can it just be f of d? No, it won't. Thank you for playing. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what g prime of x is, basically. Right? Oh, it'll be f of x. Alright, let's prove it. Because the x would just substitute in the place of t. Alright, you ready? So here's what we do. Uh, since I'm trying to figure out what the derivative is, and what is this function, how can you describe this function to me? As, as I make x increase, I keep adding what to it? I keep adding more area. I love it. So one way to do this is to do like we did uh, to find derivatives in the first place. We consider x plus h. And we see what happens. Right? We, we, we take a little step and we see how much the function changes. Okay. So uh, g of x plus h. Let me see if I can get you guys to go with me. I'm going to change the equal sign in a second. I almost did it already. And well, I mean, what is g of x plus h in symbols? Let's just, just, just start off there. Uh, the change in x. Integral, from integral from 0 to x plus h, right? Is that cool? Okay. I don't have to go all that far until a little bit later. Um, let me see if I can get you guys to go with me here. So the, uh, another way to think of g of x plus h is it's g of x plus this area. Is that cool? So this equals g of x plus that area. Now here's why I'm going to change this to an approximately, and you'll see how I'm going to use this in a second. Because how can I approximate this area? Well, I can say it's approximately equal to that bar there, right? Is that cool? And that's sort of like what we've been doing with areas is we've been approximating with rectangular areas. How do I make that area become better and better? Let h go to zero. Zero, right? Uh, <laughs> keep, keep playing the game. It's all right. You can't, it's a game you can't lose right now. Is to, is to say things. It's all right. So this area is equal to this area plus the area of that bar. Now, now, what is the area of that bar? How wide is it? H. H. And how tall is it? No. How tall is it? F of X. <laughs> Right? I did that on purpose because I, I'm going to let h go to zero. Because why would I do that? Because that's what derivatives do, right? And this is really seeing how much does this change if I take an infinitesimal step over. So of course I'm going to let h go to zero. You guys follow? Mm -hmm. So if h is big, this, this sucks. This approximation sucks. If h is big, I'm like, well, that's a lot that I'm off by. So I'm going to let h go to zero. But the height then is approximately f of x. F of x. 
Because as h goes to zero, that's what the height's going to definitely be, no matter what I want to do. So these, this area is this area plus this area, which is h times f of x. It's not exactly equal to because that is an approximation. It's and it's not. obviously wrong. But how are we going to improve? Let me rewrite this and then we'll improve, and improve our approximation. Right. So let me subtract it over and divide by h. What does that look like? <laughs> Oops, this is still approximately. So how do I take that approximately away? I have to let what happen? h go to zero. Let h go to zero. So it's from the Hey, Why would that take away the... <laughs> Because it gets infinitely close. Because why is this wrong? Because if I get closer, then the height is getting more, is getting better. The error is is better. I'm not as far off as I was. It only becomes perfectly f of x is a height if I actually let h go to zero. And of course, so what's this? How do I write that? So it's g prime. So now let's really think about what this means. If I differentiate both sides, this is what it's saying, the derivative of the integral goes away, basically, right? And I replace that t with an x, because that's how far I went. And what is x? Anything on the x-axis, right? So it truly is a function of any x, it's whatever x you wanted to say. <laughs> So what I've just shown then, let me see if you guys can get this. Uh, the derivative of g is little f. So g itself is the Big of f. Antiderivative. antiderivative of f. I could have I could have called this what? Big ass, Big ass f. Yes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> right. Sounds like. All right, so, so let's really just say what we just, let's get what we just said, because this is important, because now the second part, this is the first part of the fundamental theorem, this is the second part of the fundamental theorem, which is the part that's going to make integration as easy as derivatives became, as long as the function inside is not too bad. We'll see what I mean in a second. Um, so the second part, so, so the first part we figured out that... Um, this, what we effectively figured out, let me kind of get, take some of the details away, is the, an antiderivative, but of course there's that plus C thing, right? Any antiderivative could be off by a constant, I don't know where it is on the y-axis. So the second part, so that's basically what the first part says, it proves that the integral of f is an antiderivative of f. So now the second part says the integral from a to b of f of x dx equals big ass f of b minus big ass f of a. That's the one that's going to become, going to make everything so much easier. So the problem that we were working on earlier with the uh, a to b x squared, using this would be stupid easy because it is. If I have x squared there, what's the answer to x squared? X cubed over three. So it'd be Q cubed over three minus A cubed over three. Done. Next. Thank you. But of course, I mean, you've got to go through that to really see what goes into these integrals. These symbols hide so much work behind them that went into putting these things together. And that works because the derivative and antiderivative are inverses of each other. So they technically just cancel out. Yes. We, we, since we proved that the derivative of this is effectively... Uh, at little f, right? Let me not make that a part of this, but the derivative of this is, is little f, then this itself must be big X f, must be the antiderivative. If I prove that the derivative of something is f, I don't say this, uh, you guys with me? If yeah. the derivative of this is f, then then uh, I've lost it myself. True. <laughs> <sighs> If the derivative of this is f, then this must be the antiderivative of f. Are you with me? Yeah. Alright, thank you. So if you took the antiderivative, or if you took the derivative of big f, you'd get little f. 
Yeah, that is a known. We knew that before. Big ass F is an antiderivative, so we knew this was true. Now, I really want you to understand, before today, I didn't, may, I didn't say that this was an antiderivative. We just proved. We, all we knew about this symbol before today was that it found the area under a function. There is nothing about that that should say that it's equal to the antiderivative. There's nothing about that that says that. Do you understand? There's nothing. And I know some of you guys have had some calculus before, so and sometimes teachers gloss over that point. But that is a huge, obviously, it's a huge freaking point. The fact that this equals an antiderivative is insane in a way. Finding areas under functions is the same as finding their antiderivatives. There's no reason that should be true necessarily, but we proved it's true. And we go, oh shit, thank God. So there was actually hundreds of years where people needed to find areas and they were doing it the way that this way with ugly ass functions. Not the nice, pretty functions you guys get, right? And so finally somebody proved this, and then they, I'm sure there was somebody about to die, and they're like, that would have been good to know. <laughs> Shit! <laughs> Sorry. I just can't imagine that. Like, it, like a problem would take you weeks, and then somebody comes out, oh yeah, they just proved this, they're done. I would have to kill that person. <laughs> I would have to. They would have to understand, come out, they should have, right in the middle of the sentence, they're like, he's going to kill me. I just don't know, it's going to happen. All right, all right. <laughs> uh, real quick on this one. Um, oh man, I'm on too many meds right, I think, right now. So I want to really keep myself straight. All right, so look here. Uh, oh, let me draw this picture. So a little quick proof of this. Uh, if I've got a function from A to B, so I know this area. Uh, let me investigate. Let me let me prove this by looking at this side first and prove that it equals that side. It's easier to do. What does this mean from the first part of the fundamental theorem? This is the integral from zero to b of this, right? Let me make this f of t right now. Well, I don't have to do that. I can make it x. I don't have x's in there. Yeah, there's two. Okay. Um, let me stop there. Is that cool? I mean, that's what that represents now. We know that from the first part of the fundamental theorem, the integral from zero to something is the answer derivative at that point. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, and what's f of a? Same thing. Integral from zero to a. Yeah. So if I get this area, this is f of b, and I get f of a, here's f of a, how do I get f from, how do I get the area from A to B? Subtract. Subtract them. So I would take F of B minus F of A equals integral of 0 to B. You remember I told you to watch out for this? Oops, subtract. All right, let me stop there for a second. Well, yeah, exactly. So uh, geometrically, that's the idea. Now we apply some properties of integrals, and I can make it do like we did earlier, right? Yeah. Plus. <coughs> and, and now the middleman is that, so it becomes the integral from the A to B, which is what uh, this is. Yay! So I started on this side, and I proved that it equals that side. Is that just common sense, though? Like Not totally, but right. sort of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. But the, the first part is the one that's, uh, and to be honest, I didn't get anywhere near as rigorous with the proof of the first part as you really would have to. But I just wanted to get it understood. Right? I wanted to show you a semi-proof of the first part. Because once you know the first part of the theorem, then the second part almost just is it's just given to you. Like you said, you're right. It's basically there. Once you know the first part, the second part is like, of course. Uh, so here's what this means for us now. Oh, good. All right. Today's okay. That's exactly as much time as I wanted there to be. Okay. So what this means for us now is uh, what's a, what's a, what's one that we did? We did this one. Here we go. Let's just do the same one. So we had this integral of this is the one on that handout, right? Yes. 
4x from 2 to 5. Well, now we know, what, what's the antiderivative of 4x? Four, uh, uh, so here's how you represent this to be nice. We go, we write it like that, and that means 2x squared evaluated from 2 to 5. So get used to that notation. So now you just do, yeah, you always plug this guy in first. 2 times 5 squared minus 2 times 2 squared. <coughs> Do you have to divide it by anything or no? No. Well, uh, we sort of did. It. Remember, this is 4x squared over 2. That's why there's a 2 there. I always like to think of it as, this doesn't always work, but since it's 4, that's 2 times 2x, and that 2 would just go back up, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's 2x squared. So whichever way you need to look at it to make it work. But antiderivatives, nice and easy on, pre on, on polynomials, period, end of story. Uh, what do I get here? 32. 50 minus 8. 8, 42, and what do we get? 42. 42. Yay, and look at all this, look at all this, right? And, and look at the function. I want you to realize, is that a hard function? No. Well, look at the work involved to find the area. So before they discovered that antiderivatives were directly related to the areas under functions, people had to do this. For any function, because so that is a remarkably simple function. Imagine like 4 natural log of x plus 7 minus the square root of x squared minus 4x. And now do this. Do it, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is 5 3. Yeah. 5 3 is the fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus, the F talk from now on. Alright, so 5-3 is the first section you are officially allowed to integrate correctly. I mean, this, this is the basic idea of integration. We had to go through the Riemann, some of the adding up of the rectangles to see what goes into this. And then we can step back and appreciate, oh, thank God, <laughs> that it's related to the integer. But, I mean, now you get stuff like, this is where people, you got to be careful. If I have stuff like this, this is not easy. You can't just integrate top and bottom separately because you can't do that with derivatives. So how in the world could you do that with the opposite of derivatives? Right? So it's nowhere near as simple. So we have to develop other ways to do it. On this specific problem, you can actually just, you can long divide. You guys see that? So you have different ways to simplify this. I don't have a quotient rule for derivative, for uh, integrals. So if you long divide this, Believe it or not, this will work. 3, 3x three plus 3, change the signs, minus 3, so minus 3 over x plus 1. Right? And what do you think the integral of 1 over x is? Natural log of x. Natural log of the absolute value of x. Believe it or not. Yes, ma'am. Um, will we be getting any like, cases, or at least like on the test, will we get anything that would not be solvable? Like any antiderivatives? Or, like, no, no. Yeah, fine. Okay. That would be so mean. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but we'll continue. Now what we're going to do, now that we know the full story of integrals, that they find areas, but they are directly related to antiderivatives. So antiderivative and integral, same thing. Now we're going to continue. Now we're going to start to learn rules of integration, just like we learned rules of derivatives, chain rule, product rule. There's no exact corollary or analog to that with integration, so we have to learn integrals rules for when these functions get more and more complicated. So that's what we're going to start to do now. And then if you take 280, you just continue to learn even more and more and more rules of integration. Are we going to do like rotations and right. Yes, that's some of the last stuff we do is washers and discs. Oh, yeah. oh my, rotations. Yeah. Um,